All right. In this video, we'll be going through the Puppies and Planets lab together, making sure that you guys are comfortable with a lot of the commands in the plots package, and making sure you're comfortable finding models for data using semi-log and log-log plots to guide what type of model you use. So I've gone through and already put in Sassy's birth weight from 0 to 70. So this sequence command, which I've actually put the exact version of the sequence command I'd like you guys to use in the future um, in here, and we're going to plot our two lists of data um, using the plot command. So this is plot. Um, remember we put our uh, independent variable first, followed by our dependent variable, and for a scatter plot, use style equals point. So right now this is in larger graph slightly. It looks pretty good on this screen. Um, I'm going to add things like a title to my graph, so Sassy's age. Um, over time, sorry, Sassy's, <laughs> Sassy's weight over time, although I guess this technically is showing us Sassy's age over time as well, and our labels for this. Um, I'm going to, in this lab, um, use a decent number of the typed commands so you guys can see them in action. Um, so for labels, um, our first, like, we make sure that any like string that we want to put in as a label, we'll put between quotation marks. So we'll label our axis down here, so this is Sassy's age, as um, her age in days, and our y-axis we're going to label with um, weight in pounds. So one of the nice things about using commands to do this rather than clicking um, somewhere is if we make any changes we won't accidentally erase the nice data that we've done. Um, if we ever want to use a command like semi-log or log, those are in a special pl package called plots. So um, often if you guys are running into problems where things just don't seem to be working right, the problem is a large portion of the time that you guys have forgotten to load the plots package. So this, um, if I hadn't hidden the command, um, this is a list of all the commands that plots imported. That colon all a colon does at the end of a line, wherever it's showing up in the lab, is suppress the output so that you can't see it. Um, so making a semi-log plot of our graph, we get something like this. Now that our semi-log plot is here, I'm actually going to, instead of using the, the right-click on the graph and toggle grid lines so that was in the axes position, there's actually a nice command that's built into Maple that you can just use as a text command. So I'm going to use, um, since we're trying to change grid lines, the command's pretty easy to remember. It's grid lines. And since we want to turn them on, in Maple, instead of saying on and off, it'll say true or false. So to make grid lines appear, um, we use the command true. And if you look at your, um, your graph, you can actually see the grid lines <clears throat> are getting closer together the closer we're getting to 10, and then space widely again. So we can see from this, this is a graph where we've taken the log of our dependent variable and left our independent variable evenly spaced. So this makes it a little easier for us to immediately recognize this as a semi-log plot. Um, if we actually wanted to, instead of looking at semi-log plots, just uh, from the fact that this is a straight line, we can already be pretty comfortable seeing that Sassy's weight is modeled by an exponential function. If we wanted instead to, uh, to see what happens when we take a, like a power function, we can use the command log log plot to get this. And as several people have told me, this was a, actually a graph where it, for some reason, when you right clicked and tried to change um, properties, like which data extants you were using, that didn't always work. Um, I'm going to turn grid lines on down here as well first, and then we're going to adjust what part of the graph we can see using a built in typed command called a view. So you can remember this since it's what am I looking at or what am I viewing? And our inputs for this are in a log log plot we want to avoid going down to zero. But we could start um, since Sassy's weight, like you know, her, her next after day zero, her next weight is taken at day ten, maybe we'll start at day, you know, day eight or nine, and go up to day seventy, which is the last day that we weighed her. Uh, maybe just let's go up to day eighty so we can see this in the center of our graph. Um, her smallest weight was 3.25 pounds, so we're going to look at, for our y variables, y ranges from 3 
up to her heaviest weight was 19, so from 3 to 20. So this view command will actually like supersede any built-in things that Maple's trying to do with its graphical user clicks. So as soon as we do that, um, we actually get to see our graph nicely zoomed in so that we can see all of our data points with the exception of that first one that kind of disappeared. Um, but we can see from this that Sassy's weight isn't going to be modeled by some polynomial function. So just comparing, since our semi-log plot was straight, this immediately tells us that Sassy's weight must be exponential. Um, since our log-log plot was not straight, it's not pol polynomial. So we've changed our commands appropriately, and we've added grid lines. So from this, you guys should have, in your labs, explained what we knew about semi-log and log-log plots. It's also not a bad idea to write down, before you start putting stuff, uh, before you start defining all of your constants, it's not the worst idea to actually write down the function that you're going to be using. Um, you shouldn't run it through until you've defined the constants involved, but writing down the function might make it a little easier for you to remember exactly what you're solving for. So this is a weight function, and make sure you use the arrow notation. So this is exactly that. My function's name is w, my independent variable is t, and my formula for my function is this a e to the kt. So before I run this through, um, we know that since Sassy's weight was modeled by a straight line with a semi-log plot, that means that this slope k is going to be the natural log of her weight at, let's say, the last day, minus the natural log of her weight on the first day that she was measured, divided by her age. So one of the advantages for, we called our, our lists age and weight, and our advantage for, um, for keeping, when we're writing down our, our slope, keeping them in this form, pulling out the eighth element on our list and the first element on our list, is that when we, if we do need to change anything later, it's going to be a lot easier for us than if we had to type in every single time the data points themselves. Similarly, now for Sassy's weight, we actually do know um, what her weight was at time zero, but it's also good practice um, to think about using our formula to solve for a. So we know that a times e to the kt should be equal to her weight at any given time, so we could also use that to solve for a. So her weight at time, um, at time one, so her, her very first weight at time zero, divided by her age at time zero, uh, e of k times her age at time zero. So that since our age is our independent variable and our weight is our dependent variable, this is just solving our equation through for that a. And note that it output exactly what we would have expected, just plugging it straight in. So now that we've defined our a and our k, we can make our, a nice function that uses these. So again, this is this is not necessary, and you can do some of these things by hand, but it's good practice, especially as we're going to look at more and more complicated data sets later where you're going to have to try a bunch of different things to try to get as good a fit as possible, to set this up nicely so you can edit it quickly if you need to. Um, one of the nice things that was built into this lab is we actually gave you guys an exact list of commands that you should use. So for data plot, um, remember that your data is you know, just the, the scatter plot that we started with. Um, our model plot is now that we have that function w defined, we're just, we just want to use it from time 0 up to time 70. And these other commands are just to make it look a little easier to read, so thickness 2. And we could display them both on the same set of axes. So you notice that I actually put all these things in one box. Um, to move to another line, you hit Shift and Enter. But that's neither here nor there. That's not necessary, but it's convenient. Again, if you're running through lots of things, you're making a lot of changes, any small bit of convenience helps. And if we were, um, if you were submitting a, a copy of this to me, you guys have probably been clicking on things and changing labels. Um, there's a nice, again, we can use the command label 
labels, um, her age, make sure everything's a string, age in days, um, her weight in pounds, and the title of the graph is Sassy's Weight Over Time. There's a nice graph including a model. So this is our graph of our function along with the data. And I'm pretty happy with our fit. We might do a little bit better if we pick slightly different data points, but I think this is a pretty pretty accurate predictor of Sassy's weight over time, at least for the first 70 days. So one thing that we could check with this is since our formula is, you know, our W is our, our function here, we could check what our weight is at 55 days by just plugging in 55. So we would guess that Sassy's around 13 pounds on day 55, but if we try to predict how much she weighs at six months, well, six months, let's assume all months are 30 days, um, her weight at six months would be her weight at 180 days, which is 304 pounds, which is probably not a good estimate for a weight of a golden retriever um, at six months old. So some of the problems with um, using our formula outside of her puppyhood when she's growing quickly is eventually not all models are good fits for all data, but they might be good fits for data in a small period of time. So I'm going to follow the file's instructions and save my file just in case. But this is a good, you know, th this was a good example of finding data that was modeled by an exponential function and matching our, um, matching up a model to our data. All right, I jumped ahead a little bit and typed in all of our data. So this is just the data in that chart. Um, our first test, if you're ever just given a data set, is we're going to start by plotting our data set. Um, remember to make sure that you convert this to a, a scatter plot. So we can tell, although our, you know, it's really only those first four, um, we, the first four planets in the solar system are called the terrestrial planets or Earth-like planets, and the two other planets that we have are much further out, Jupiter and Saturn, so we can't see them very closely, uh, but it doesn't look like a straight line. Um, one of the advantages of plotting these things in Maple is we can quickly change this to a log plot and see that a log plot, if anything, is less of a straight line than our, our just standard plot. So a semi-log plot isn't going to give us a good straight line. And a log-log plot, that looks pretty nice. So with a log-log plot, we get to see like a straight line in our distances, which means that the length of, uh, of our year would be well predicted by some polynomial function in the distance. And in particular, it's going to be a power function with an exponent given by the slope of the log-log, you know, the slope of this log-log plot. So we're not going to keep this log-log plot. We're going to actually save this as our data plot planets. Um, and I'm going to add um, a title. So this is uh, length of year by distance. And our labels are going to be our distance from sun in millions of miles. And our year length is in days. So our graph, if you want to see ahead of time what we just saved, um, that'll be what our graph will look like. Remember that you're always going to be plotting your model against your original set of data, not your data in a log plot or a log log plot. So I'll hide this for, for now. Um, we know since this is going to be modeled by a polynomial function that we're looking for some, let's call our year length, maybe the function will be yl, and it'll be a function of distance. So since we haven't used the variable x at any other point in this worksheet, it's a fine variable to use. Um, it's going to be some constant a times x to some power p. And so we're going to be setting our power using the slope of that log log plot, and our a using any one of these um, six data points. So my screen kind of jumped there. Um, for uh, our first one that we want to set is always going to be our, our slope. So since it's the log log plot and we may have to change it, um, our y value is year length. So we have six data points. So I'm going to start with just the first 
and the last. And I'm going to divide this. Remember, if you want to have to divide a whole thing, you can actually highlight everything and then just hit the divide symbol. And we're going to divide that by distances. So the sixth, oh, sorry, the natural log of these, since this is the log log plot, we have to make sure that we take the natural log of our distances. And so that's our, our approximate p value. So we can actually see what that is by either right clicking on it and selecting approximate. Or there's actually another command that you can just type in called evalf, where you can see up to several decimal places what this is. So it looks like our exponent is around one and a half. So we're, if we can avoid it, we'd like to never have to type in a long string of numbers. So anytime you can assign a value to a variable, that way you're able to change these things quickly, um, it's a good plan to do so. So right now our p is nicely saved. And we're going to use the same technique that we did before to set our a. We know that our y value divided by x to the p should be this a. So this y value is equal to ax to the p. So that means our year length, which is our, our y's, let's maybe start with the first year length. And we can divide that by our distances to that power that we calculated. So this is just solving our equation for a. And it's not a bad idea if you're ever kind of struggling to find a form for it. Pull out a pencil and paper and write down what your function is. But that looks something like that. So eval f of this a to give us a, an approximation is 0 0.406. So what that, that number means is if you plugged in x is equal to 1, um, like 1 unit from the sun, so 1 million miles from the sun, um, our year length would be a little under um, half a day. So about 0.4 days puts it at 40% of a day, maybe um, something like 8 to eight to 10 hours. So now that we've entered both our A and our P and we have those saved, we can run through our model that just, um, it's a polynomial function with power P. Um, at this point we have our data saved. We still need to actually produce a, a model plot for planets. I think I called it model plot planets, or data plot planets. So plot, this y of l is a function of x, and we're going to plot it from x is equal to 0 up to um, our highest x value we want to be able to plug in accurately right now is around 886, so maybe from 0 to 900 is a good range to look at. And I'm still going to set my color a little different and thicken it just a little bit. So you can feel free to get creative with your coloring when you're doing these things, but it's a good idea, if possible, to make your model a different color than your data points so you can really see them lying on top of each other. So there's our model, and we can display these. So our model plot planets and our data plot planets, which typically um, the order doesn't matter a little bit except we're uh, planets. We would wind up losing our labels if we displayed them in the opposite order. So this is a nice graph um, predicting our uh, length of our year in terms of planetary distance from the sun. So our four planets, so th three planets in this, um, you folks actually probably also did Eris, which has a really interesting reason that it's not that, that accurately predicted. But this planetary distance that we wrote down, which I called year length, we can just type in our approximation. And I'm going to run this through even though it's going to give me a really interesting output. So this output, whew, that's intimidating. Um, what that, that is is Maple tries to, uh, uh, like to evaluate things symbolically if it can. So this is Maple leaving everything plugged in. So we're going to change this to eval f to just get the like a numerical value. So this says that the length of a year on Uranus is around 30,700 days, which in years, remembering that, um, remembering that, uh, that our, um, our length in, uh, you know, we're, well, there are 365 days in a year, we can actually do um, mod 30, let's say 307, uh, 
307.24, um, there are 365 days, so there are 64 days left, left over. So that means, um, sorry, I guess I should have done, like instead of 365 days left over, we probably want 3724 divided by 365. So that says it's around around 84 years for Uranus to make a single um, orbit. So I'm not going to finish filling out the rest of these, but I will comment that if you guys modeled the, um, the length of the year of Eris, your prediction was probably a little off. And just to give you a picture of why that's the case, um, if we actually looked at year length of Eris, we did images, you'll be able to, to see this. Let's make this quite large. Well, as large as I can, can get it. Um, most of the planets in our solar system, even including Pluto, have relatively circular orbits. They're all actually ellipses with the Sun sitting at one of the major foci of the ellipse. But Eris has a much more eccentric orbit, where eccentric actually means like a, a technical term here, but Eris's orbit is much further from a circle, making this less of a good predictor of the length of the day and years. So for those of you that were running into sort of problems in labs where your, your model didn't seem to be fitting all the data, that's good because that's actually telling you that Eris is different than the other interior planets or other gas giants as well. So I think this is probably a good place to stop. So just to recap what we've gotten at this point from our lab is you guys have now seen another example of taking some set of data that you think might be modeled by an exponential or a power function using log or semi-log plots and log-log plots to um, test your hypothesis and then finding a model that nicely fit your data. So just to give credit where it should be due, this Puppies and Planets lab, while it's been adapted for Maple, is actually from a laboratory, from, pro, uh, from Calculus as a Laboratory course, or Project Calc, put together by Duke and the authors of our textbook. So I hope you guys enjoyed this lab, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week.